let's get started. Compassion fatigue, stress, burnout. Um, anyone familiar with any of those topics? Yeah, absolutely. Anyone have first-hand experience with any of those topics? Absolutely. So uh, the roles could be reversed. You could be up here at minimum, even if you've never researched it, at minimum, you could be up here giving personal stories. So I know that, that you have a lot of experience with this. Let me tell you my objective for today. My objective for today, we're gonna cover three topics in less than one hour now, because we're running behind. So we are gonna cover stress, burnout, and compassion fatigue. We are gonna show the difference between them, because clinically there is a significant difference be between the three. People used to call everything burnout, but then around the 80s, uh, Dr. Charles Figley kind of came into the scene and started researching compassion fatigue and brought that differentiation. That's what we're going to focus on today. This is going to be feel a little bit like a fire hose. Okay, lots of information. That's why you have packets. Let me tell you a little bit about what you have in your packet. First of all, you have a work-life balance wheel. We will discuss that a little later. You have a vulnerability to stress assessment. This assessment is not showing you how stressed you currently are. What it is showing you is when stress comes and knocks at your door, how can you respond? So there are certain life choices that we make that either make us vulnerable or make us less vulnerable to stress. This assessment is going to show you when stress comes, how likely are you to succumb to it? Um, according to your life decision. So that's an important stress assessment. I encourage you to take that a little later. And then you have some uh, papers in there to take notes. What do I recommend you take notes on? Any ahas. So anything that I say that you think, oh, yeah, I know that one. Write that down. Write down those aha moments. Or if you have ahas for other people, you know, we usually get ahas for other people more often. So if you have ahas for other people, you can write those down to you. All right, so why are we talking about this today? Who's traveled before on an airplane? Been on an airplane? Yep. All right, so you know, when you get on the airplane, what do they say? Yeah, so they, they show you the, the lighting and the exits and all of that, right? I, I think it's real fancy how they do it, by the way. And then they tell you to put your mask on first. I love what they say. They don't say, like, in case all the oxygen in this aircraft disappears and we're going to die, put a mask on. They say, in case, in the chance of a change in cabin pressure, put your mask on first, right? So let me tell you a little bit about what happens. One time I'm traveling to Vegas. And I mean, I travel a lot, but this one particular time I'm traveling to Vegas, it's not as fun as it sounds. We have family there. Um, so we're traveling with, with my family to Vegas and I'm really intense. So the lady is, the stewardess is giving her whole spiel. You know, they tell you, take the cue card from the back seat pocket, and I do. I'm the only one in the plane paying attention. Everybody else is like on phones. But they said, give me your undivided attention for two minutes. So I'm like, yeah, you got it. And I'm there, I'm listening, I got the cue card, I'm giving eye contact, active listening cues, everything. Like me and her, we're buds. I could save the plane if it was going down. Really could. However, when she was done, she still came right over to me and said, hi there. In case of a change in cabin pressure, what would you do? And I was a little offended as to why she felt I didn't have the cognitive ability to understand what to do in the case of cabin pressure. I wasn't sure if, what her reason was for thinking that I did not understand that concept. So a little bit offended. But then I realized that she saw something else. She saw the carry-ons that I travel with. She saw this. And she knew that no matter how much I showed her eye contact, and no matter how much I pulled out that seat back pocket, that if that plane went down, that the mama in me would take care of my babies. She knew that. But you see, she also knew that the cabin pressure on the plane is so much different than just holding your breath. 
And she knew that if the plane went down and this mama didn't put her mask on first, that she'd have a whole row of blondy blues out like a light. And you see, you do the same thing. Every day as caregivers, we go around and I put your mask on you and your mask on you and your mask on you and I don't take care of myself. But you see, you can only give what you have. You give out of who you are. So if you are not filled up, if you are not caring for yourself, if you are not breathing, my friends, then you don't live. On that airplane, if I were to stop breathing, what would happen? Let's, let's test your science knowledge, ready? Your medical knowledge here. If I were to stop breathing on the airplane, what would happen? Yeah. The clinical term is I would die, okay? <laughs> Let me tell you what happens and work when you stop breathing. Breathing as in taking care of yourself. You die too, but not in real life, but you die. And then you come back every day to work as what I call a zombie. You're the walking dead. You clock in, you clock out, you do your job. You're not engaged, you're not excited, but you're there. Anyone seen zombies at work before? All right, so we're gonna learn to put our masks on first. Let's start talking about stress. You know a little bit about stress? Little bit, right? Ever felt like this? So let's talk real quick. Why do we get so stressed out? What are some reasons? There are multiple reasons we could spend an entire session just on stress, we're not going to. Let's think about it this way. How many different hats do you wear? What different titles? And I want to go ahead and do this like um, popcorn popping in the microwave. You know what that sounds like, right? Pop, 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 pop. So I want you real quick like popcorn, shout out all the different hats you wear. For instance, hi. Sorry, picking on you. What's your name? Patty. Patty. What's uh, one hat you wear? Mother. And that's the only hat you have in life, right? You're just mom. No. Can you give me one more hat? A boss, yeah, yeah, a boss. Okay, so you're a leader, you're a boss, all right? So those are some hats. Let's throw a few more out real quick. I'll give you one more example of another hat. A hat I have in my life is Tooth Fairy, all right? By the way, my children only lose to teeth when I go out of town, which is super stressful because dad is not a very effective Tooth Fairy. He really isn't. I got all sorts of stories about the times that I've lied to my, I mean, the times that I have um, creatively told stories to my children about the Tooth Fairy and her efforts. All right, so tell me a few other titles, a few hats you wear. Go. Teacher, wife, daughter, grandmother, chauffeur, counselor, Legal guardian, huh? Dictator, all right, we've got a lot of different titles, lots of titles going on in our lives, right? So I'm a, a mom, a wife, a friend, a daughter, a granddaughter, a sister, an aunt, a cousin, um, an elder in my spiritual community, a leader at my work, I have my side job and my main job, and then I have five kids, five kids, my friends, and a husband and a dog, that is seven. <laughs> seven, it is crazy. Yeah, so we've got lots of titles going on in our lives. Let me ask you a question, what's the cost? When you have all of these hats that you're wearing, what's the cost to your health? Hmm? Big cost, yeah. What, what's that look like? Tired. Exhausted, tired, crabby, crabby. Not, eating. 
Overweight, not eating. Heart palpitations, sleep deprived, huh? addictions, low self esteem, high blood pressure. We got the lows and highs all mixed up here, right? How about, let's skip down to our organization as far as our companies. What, what's the cost there? Absences. What else? Chaos. You're your best, right? You're the best, whatever your title is you've ever been. You're the best teacher, the best social worker, right? No. So we, we get tired, we get sick, we call in. We're not giving our best, we're not engaged, we're not going the next extra mile. How about our family? What's the cost to our family? We're crabby. That word keeps coming up. We're crabby. If I am a tired, crabby talent management consultant, which is my title, if I am a tired, crabby talent management consultant, when I get home every day, then what kind of mom am I? I'm a tired, crabby mom. Or we lovingly refer to her as momster mm -hmm, or momzilla. You know, she's like, I said put the lunchbox up for the fifth time. Come on, you know you do it too. I'm not the only one, right? Right? Okay, so we're not our best for our family. We're tired, we're cranky, we're stressed out. We're not giving them our best. I remember several years ago, um, well, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever like baked a lot of stuff for a bake sale? Like whether, or you've seen someone do it at least. You know, they bake a bunch of cookies for a church bake sale or Girl Scouts or whatever, right? So let me ask you a question. You're baking all these cookies so it's like cookie sheets going in and out of the oven and going on the counter and you got a whole like assembly line going on here. And occasionally there's a batch of cookies that get a little darker and a little crispier than they're supposed to. What do you do with those cookies? You eat them, and who do you give them to? You take them to the church? No. no, who do you give them to? Your family! The people you love the most in the whole world get the crap that you won't serve to anyone else. You are so wonderful. That's so kind of you. I would never do that to my family. Kidding, let me tell you. So a few years ago, I used to make cakes for people for their birthdays. Um, big four-tier fondant cakes, they took forever, right? And one day, my child at that time, he's about two years old, and he came up and he said, hi, mom, oh, a cake, who are you making the cake for? Is it for church or for work or for your friends? And I said, oh, it's for Miss Marcy, buddy, it's her birthday. He said, oh, okay, cool, and ran off. And then the next time I had a cake, I'm walking out the door, and he said, oh, mom, who's the cake for? Is it for church or for work or for your friends? He really talks like that, too. And um, I said, oh, it's for church, blah, blah, blah. And then I had an epiphany that my child knows that if I'm baking a cake, it is absolutely not for him. But don't worry, I'm not a horrible mother. They got cake. Because when you bake a big cake like that, you have to cut off the butt of the cake. You have to level it. So I would cut off the butt, throw a little bit of frosting on it, and then throw them a piece of cake, right? Which was cool. They liked that. They like the butter cake with frosting, it tastes the same. But I realized that was my way of giving burnt cookies. Here's the extra. You were an afterthought. And I didn't like it. Because it wasn't just in cakes, because it never is just cakes or cookies, right? It's other things. This is just the easy way to talk about it. And so I made a big effort to stop giving my family the burnt cookies. So I went to the store and I bought a cake mix and I made them a cake. And I know it's super simple, but you have to start to train your brain in simple ways to change. So I made a cake and I put it in a pretty little glass cake dish and I put it on the counter. And my, mom, my son said, Mom, who's the cake for? Is it for church or for work or for your friends? I said, it's for you, bud. He said, the whole thing? I said, no, bro, slow your roll, you get a slice. And he was super excited. And then I know that I've reached a big victory because a few months ago I was in the kitchen cooking and 
I was making cookies, and he ran in, he's much older now, and he ran in and he just said, oh, cookies, I love cookies, and ran out. Because he didn't even remember that there was a possibility these aren't for you. And I knew that I had made some changes, and that was good. And again, cookies are just a real simple way to talk about it. What are the changes we need to make in our life? So when stress comes, when we're wearing all these hats, here's the crazy thing about these hats. Most of them were created to make you happier. Most of them are the reason you say you live, the reason you say you work, the reason you say you do the things you do. The very things that are stressing you out were the very things designed to give you joy. Why are we turning this around? So the number one thing I want you to do, and then we're going to talk about burnout and compassion fatigue, which is really why we're here. Number one thing I want you to do to combat stress. We're starting the school year off strong, but it's going to get worse. I mean harder. I mean more stressful. So what do I want you to do? I want you to take 10. Take 10 minutes just for you. 10 minutes to go for a walk or listen to music, or read a book. Some of you probably take a lot more than 10 minutes, okay? And that's fantastic. Keep going. Some of you, honestly, probably don't take 10 minutes. You got to make sure you're taking time every day for yourself to put your mask on you first. You can garden, you can exercise, whatever you want to do. I wish I was really cool and said like I did something like productive, like I garden and I read books. I don't, I watch TV. That's what I like to do because nobody expects anything of me and uh, I don't have to think for 15 minutes. I only usually get about 15 minutes. By the way, if you only have 15 minutes, kudos for you, it's five minutes over what I expect. And just watch the end of whatever episode. Okay, you, you watch at the 45 mark and catch everything that happened and you're good to go. All right, so 10 minutes every day. Let's step into a new corner. Let's talk about compassion fatigue. What is compassion fatigue? Compassion fatigue is vicarious traumatization. It is a second-hand PTSD. It is where you actually have post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, but you came about them vicariously, which means you experienced someone else's trauma. Whether you experienced from um, seeing it firsthand or from them telling you about it, you experienced their, their trauma, and it has started to change you. What we're looking for here is a change in behavior, a change from your baseline, a change in who you are. So in stress, stress does the same thing. Stress starts to change you, right? So stress does little things like you start to become clumsy or you start to forget things or you start to think that things happened a week ago when they happened a day ago. These are all little signs. But here's the thing. We are great liars. So we lie. We tell ourselves, I'm okay. I'm good. I've been doing this for 15 years. I know this would stress most people out, but I'm, I'm okay. Here's the problem with that. Any other great liars in the room? Yeah, a few of you are honest. All right, we lie to ourselves. Here's the problem with that. Your body and your brain, they don't pull for your opinion. They don't care what you think. And they're going to send you little signs that say, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. When you start tripping and being clumsy, it's your brain saying, I'm not okay. When you start to be snippy and you didn't realize you were, your brain saying, I can't handle it. When you're forgetting everything, it's shouting at you saying, I'm overwhelmed. You've got to put your mask on. That's stress. That's different than compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is vicarious trauma. It is your brain saying, without your permission, it got traumatized. And it has created a trigger, just like in PTSD. What do I mean by a trigger? We, we're familiar with PTSD. We generally think of what when we think PTSD? Soldiers. 
Soldiers, right? And so when we think of a trigger, you would think of what? A loud sound of some sort that would remind them of a gunshot, right? Let me tell you what my trigger looked like for compassion fatigue from working with young people. I was sitting down with one of the young people in my group home. I used to run therapeutic group homes. And I was sitting down and she was telling me this about, about this very traumatic experience in her life. And as she was talking to me and reliving every detail of this horrible event that nobody should have to go through, I was listening and I was leaning in and my phone rang because they always ring at the wrong time. And so I picked it up without breaking eye contact with her and I silenced it and put it back down. That was it. And I kept listening. And then we talked and we went worked through a lot of stuff with her. Do you know, every single time for years, when I picked up my phone and swiped, I went back to her trauma. Every single time. Do you know how many times you swipe your phone every day? That was my brain's new trigger for trauma. Swipe. Without my permission, my brain kept the trauma. Mine wasn't just that one trauma, I had many traumas. Compassion fatigue can happen from one specific incident or an accumulation over time. It starts to change who you are. Now, if, if you were to hear that very difficult story from that young girl, and that day at the grocery store you were thinking about it, that's not necessarily compassion fatigue. That's called empathy. And a week later, if you were thinking about it, that's still within the normal range. And a month later, that is still within the no normal range. But where we start to get concerned is two things. Two things that we would start to think, maybe this is compassion fatigue. Number one, if you're thinking about it, if you still have those triggers about three months later. And number two, if it starts to change your baseline, if it starts to change who you are, how you think, and how you respond, okay? A lot of times we start to become overly vigilant. So we're gonna go into some of those signs. So here's a clinical definition of compassion fatigue for anyone who wants it. It's that state of tension or preoccupation with a traumatized survivor. Um, you can experience, again, experiencing the traumatic event over and over or avoidance or numbing of that traumatic event. And it's that byproduct of working with people. Why does this particularly affect caregivers? Because most people in a helping profession you're wired a little differently than most people. You're like, we know that. We know we're wired differently. So how are you wired a little differently? You have an extra dose of empathy. Empathy is that ability to pick yourself up and put yourself in someone else's shoes and get it, really get where they're coming from. The problem is you don't always get to decide when to jump out. That's when it starts to turn. So what's the difference between compassion fatigue and burnout? We kind of explain compassion fatigue. It's that state of tension or preoccupation. It's about being afraid. It changes who you are. Burnout's a little different. Burnout is about being worn out, not liking your work, not feeling effective. And I just don't want to do this anymore. So burnout would look like this. I don't like speaking for a living. I like baking cakes. I want to bake cakes. That's burnout. Do you know the solution for burnout? What? Someone said it. I said, do something else. Do something else. You know, here's the problem too. In my career, I'm a subset of HR. So as a responsible HR person, um, I'm not supposed to go into a room of thousands of people and say, if you don't like your job, quit. So I looked really hard clinically for another answer. I did all the research. I read lots of literature because I report directly to the Vice President of Human Resources. I thought there is no way she's going to let me tell everybody in my company, if you're burnt out, quit. And I looked and I looked and I looked. 
And then I sat down with her and I said, Janice, I am so sorry. The only solution for burnout is quit. She said, well, we have lots of things you could do here for our company. So if you don't like your job, you could find a new job within the organization. I said, I, I can preach that. All right. So I'm going to tell you if you're burnt out, I encourage you to maybe stay with your organization and just find a new thing to do. But it's time to move on if you really are burnt out. So how do we distinguish the difference between burnout and compassion fatigue? I tell you to ask one question. Do I love my work? Do I love what I do? Not do I love my colleagues or do I love the people around me or do I love my boss? Do I love the type of work I do? And if the answer is yes, and some of the signs and symptoms we're getting ready to review you identify with, it is possible that you are experiencing some compassion fatigue. If the answer is no, I hate my job. I hate it. I hate public speaking. I love baking cakes. That's burnout. Get a new job, my friend. Life is too short to not love your work. You should love your work. Did you know 80% of people don't love their work? How in the world could you not love your work? Do you realize you spend like 2,000 hours a year at work? That is too many hours to hate it. Too many. That's a different topic. Let's move on. All right, let's talk about some signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue. It starts to manifest itself in several different ways. Today we're going to talk about emotional, physical, personal, and work symptoms, signs, or indicators of compassion fatigue. This is, again, we're looking for a variation from your baseline. So I'm going to put some um, just generalities up here. What's the problem with generalities? They don't apply to everybody. Let me give you an example of a generality. We're going to talk about emotional indicators, anger, irritability, sadness, depression, prolonged grief, anxiety, numbness, becoming cynical or pessimistic. These are all emotional signs or indicators of compassion fatigue. Unless you have always been a negative, pessimistic person. <laughs> if you have always been a cynical, pessimistic human being, I'm not joking, I know it sounds funny, if you always have been and you start becoming very optimistic and happy, we are gonna worry about you. <laughs> Unless you have read a very good self-help book, and you have been spending time really working on this and trying to become more positive, unless you focused, if you suddenly just deviate from your baseline and you're super happy, we're worried. Okay? So, um, so these, are, these are the baselines generally, but if you happen to be the outlier, then just flip it. Okay? I know it sounds funny, but it's the truth. All right, so... Anger and irritability, numbness, pushing people aside, not wanting to feel anything, wanting to be alone all the time. These things sound like depression. Clinically, they look like depression, but if you dive a little deeper, it's different. What's some personal indicators that we're looking for? When you start to isolate yourself, you kick out your friends and your family and your colleagues and your dog and your cat, and they all have to get out. You just want to be alone. I do that too, occasionally. Occasionally we want to be alone. We're talking about this as a constant, as a new normal. When you're constantly isolating yourself. When you're getting those mood swings. When you, someone mentioned earlier, substance abuse, right? So abusing alcohol, food, drugs, sex, whatever it is. Whatever you're trying to fill in the void. You're trying to fill this hole. You're self-medicating. That's a sign. Memory and concentration problems, we're going to talk about why that's a sign. And self-entitlement, what does self-entitlement look like? So generally people went to school to be professionals or got a certification or some type of training, right? So that means you're a professional, but that's actually not good enough for us. We generally take what I call invisible badges. 
Do you know what an invisible badge is? So you got a degree to be a teacher, but you need more. Or in my case, we got training to be social workers, but you're not a real social worker until you lose your sleep. Until you can say something like, I stayed up all night last night helping Joe. I, I didn't sleep all night long. Or for medical professionals, it usually looks like I worked two 12-hour shifts in a row, 24 hours. I'm a real nurse or a real doctor. That's what it looks like. That's not self-entitlement all by itself. Let me tell you what self-entitlement looks like. It's when you say things like, I was up all night long helping Joe at the hospital. That's why I'm a little cranky today and biting everyone's heads off. I've worked two shifts in a row. In fact, I worked 60 hours this week, so I'm getting wasted all weekend, buddy. That's self-entitlement. It's a negative, it's a excuses for negative maladaptive behavior. It's a justification of your negative maladaptive behavior because of the positive things that you do. That's what self-entitlement looks like. Some physical indicators. Research has shown that compassion fatigue leads to a weakening of your immune system. So you start to get the heart palpitations and um, start to get sick more often. You start to have sleep problems, either you're sleeping all the time or not sleeping at all. Kind of goes one of both ways. Little bit about sleep. Let me tell you the problem with disrupted sleep. Did you know that if your sleep gets interrupted, so when you're sleeping at night, your brain processes traumatic events that happen throughout the day. If your sleep is interrupted or disrupted, then suddenly your brain lodges that trauma in your sympathetic nervous system and can't process it. Oftentimes, that leads to the PTSD. I understand that we cannot always avoid sleep disruption or sleep interruptions. I understand that. I have a two-year-old that up until her second surgery had sleep apnea for her entire life in conjunction with my newborn. I get that we cannot always avoid that. I didn't sleep for two years, all right? Praise the doctor who finally fixed it. But that's what happens when our sleep gets interrupted. So I knew that. So clinically, I actually had to take a lot of extra steps to make sure that I was processing events correctly. Make sense? What happens at work? You know what this looks like, right? You can read through those. Um, why is workaholism on there? Amy, there is no problem. That just means I'm passionate about my job. I just love my job. Could be. Could also mean that you're the type of personality that when you start to feel like you're losing control of the world around you, you roll up your sleeves and work harder because you're pretty sure that when you start to feel the signs and symptoms and the emotional and physical indicators that you're just gonna knock it out by doing more. No one identifies with that, right? No one like that in this room. That is why it's a sign, because sometimes we just try to knock it out. Oh, well, I just don't like my job because I'm not preparing and planning enough, so I'm now just gonna come in at 6 a.m. and stay till 6 p.m. and then I'm gonna love it more. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm gonna do. Being underappreciated and under-resourced. Hold on, my friends. You are probably underappreciated and you are probably under-resourced. So all by itself, it is not a sign. It is not an indicator. It is just life. Where does it become an indicator? When you signed up for your job, did you know? Did you know that you were most likely going to be underappreciated and under-resourced and not have what you need to get the job done? And you said... It's okay, sign me up anyways. And then somewhere along the way, you decided it is no longer okay. It is not okay that I don't have what I need and nobody ever says thank you. I am not okay with that anymore. There's a few things that could have happened. You could have changed from maturity. You could have changed from life circumstances but you could have changed because of compassion fatigue. So the reason we mention it is because your circumstances, they didn't change, you did. So you have to self-reflect why. Why did I change?
Some other indicators here for work. Triangulation. Anyone know what triangulation is? All right, triangulation is basically, it looks like this in the workplace. Person A hates person B. Person A debriefs with person C. Now person C hates person B too, right? Or it also looks like this. Let's say this is you. You're this beautiful vase of flowers. Everybody say, aw, aw. This is you on a Friday afternoon, my friends. It's Friday afternoon, you've had a good week. Maybe uh, it was appreciation week. People told you thank you. Uh, your boss was nice to you. You even got extra time to get projects done. It was a good week. And you're sitting there getting your stuff done. Maybe you're even singing a little bit, like, I got sunshine on cloud, right? And you're real excited about your job. You're loving it right now. And then someone walks in and they say, Hi, do you have a minute? I just really need to talk to you. You too? Thank you so much. Did she say yes? No. Thank you so much. I just really needed to debrief with somebody real quick. And then they start to tell you. They say things like, I was meeting with someone and they were telling me about this event that happened in their life. And then they were telling me about what happened in their childhood. And then I was thinking about what happened in mine and all the things that happened in the world around us and how we're all going to die. And it just made me really sad and I had to come and debrief with someone. And then they keep talking, keep talking, and then they say, so anyways, that's what I want to talk about. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. And then they skip out. How do you feel? Blue. You know what happened? They spewed all over you. They triangulated you. Triangulation sounds a lot like another word, doesn't it? They blewed your water. They treated you like a trash can. Here's the thing, a trash can doesn't have to be a gray receptacle. It's anything I put trash in. Because Rachel Ray has a, anyone know? A trash bowl. Do you know I found the trash bowl at the grocery store one day? I was walking by, I thought it was really pretty, so I looked at it, I thought that's a great bowl for mashed potatoes. And I went to look at it and this $22 bowl was called a trash bowl. And I was like, what? I ain't spent $22 for a pretty bowl to put trash in it, I'm putting mashed potatoes in it. So I put mashed potatoes in my bowl. Do you know nobody has ever walked in and be like, oh, Amy, you use a garbage bowl for your mashed potatoes? because it's whatever I put in it. It's the same with you. When you allow people to put trash or debrief with you, when you become that garbage receptacle, what's in you comes out. Now, should we debrief? Yes, debriefing is important. Debriefing is actually a way to help combat compassion fatigue, but there's a special way to debrief. It's called, don't treat me like your trash can. Come and talk to me. And guess who has to set those boundaries? You do. You have to set the boundaries as far as what you can hear and what you can accept and when they can talk to you. If today is not the day, if this past week, people in your life have passed away and you lost your house and your dog died and you lost everything and someone wants to come debrief with you today, you look at them and you say, no, not today. Because today's not the day, because your brain and your body, they're gonna yell at you, and they're gonna say, we can't take this. You're like, Amy, I'm not that weak. Okay, that's fine. It's just what the research says. All right, so let's real quick, let's talk about, I know this was fast, I'm sorry, I just, want to make sure you get all the information. Let's talk about resiliency and planning. If you have ever experienced these signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue, the good news is that compassion fatigue can be identified, arrested, and treated at any time. You can start to take care of it. If you're experiencing these signs and symptoms at kind of a basic level, then you can treat it by performing five resiliencies every single day. What the research has shown is there's something called post-traumatic growth. 
In post-traumatic growth, you actually become stronger after trauma than you ever were before, which actually kind of redefines what trauma is. The point of trauma is it destroys you. It hurts you. It makes you less. But researchers saw that there were a certain group of people that when traumatized, they actually became better. So they dug in and said, why'd you become better? Why did you get stronger after trauma and no one else did? And what they found is these people did five resiliencies every single day. The research has also shown this adds time to your life. So I'm taking from you about 45 minutes today. But we're going to do some resiliencies together, and I'm going to give you back seven and a half minutes to your life. That doesn't sound like I've made up for what I took yet. However, if you were to do these same resiliencies every single day, you would continue to add seven and a half minutes to your life, which means ultimately I gave you more than I took. All right? And you're telling your brain, victory, victory, victory. That's what these resiliencies do. They register victories in your brain and they recharge your battery. So let's talk about them real quick. Number one, I want you to see to it that you do three wells. Three wells every day. What do I want you to do? I want you to sleep well, eat well, and exercise well. You already know that, don't you? You already know you're supposed to be sleeping what? Eight hours, Eight hours every night because that's what physicians tell you to do. I'm not a physician, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm talking to you about your brain. What does your brain need to combat stress, compassion, fatigue, and burnout? Your brain needs six to eight hours, five times a week. That's what your brain needs. Ooh, that's better than eight hours. I could maybe do six hours, five times a week. Why do you need sleep? We could talk about your hippocampus and your amygdala and what they do to process and why you need sleep, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I want to give you an example. We're going to say you have two night shift workers that come work for you every night in your head, okay? So the first night shift worker, um, her name is, name a person in the world. Mary. Mary. Do you say Mary? All right, Mary, her job is she's a chemist, and she comes in every day and she universal precautions up, puts her gloves and everything on. She comes into your brain every night while you sleep and replenishes your chemicals. Picture glass beakers of chemicals. And she comes in and she replenishes them. Serotonin, melatonin, and all the chemicals you need to be good every day. She replenishes those. Here's the problem. She needs six to eight hours to get her job done because you depleted the chemicals all day long. In addition, she has splash hazards going on, so she can't splash. Um, so she's got to do it slowly. In addition, you are still depleting some of that reserve, so it takes a little while to refill it. All right? So she needs six to eight hours to get her job done. Make sense? We got another guy in our head. His name is... Randy, I have never had anyone say Randy before. Randy is your file clerk. His job is he takes your stack of memories that you produce all day long. His job is to timestamp and date them. To say today at 11.30, Amy was talking about compassion fatigue. And then file it away. That's Randy's job, is to file all those memories away. The problem is, if you do not give Randy six to eight hours to get his job done, he can't get it done. Some of you are actually really horrible bosses, and instead you give Randy four hours to get his job done. Not only did you only give Randy four hours to get his job done, but you also did what? You gave him 20 hours worth of memories. You gave him more work and less time to do it, and you are a horrible boss. And Randy, he's trying. He's trying to get his job done. He really is. But he can't get it all done. And then suddenly someone comes to you and says, hey, remember yesterday when we were talking about blah, 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 blah? And you say, no, I totally forgot because it wasn't yesterday. It was a week ago. And you say, no, 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 no. They say, no, it was yesterday. No, 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 it was a week ago. We talked about that like a week ago. And they said, no, Amy, you were wearing this and doing this and saying this. You say, no, it was... It was yesterday, 
totally felt like a week ago because your brain's not processing those memories. Sleep is imperative. It is important. Eating well and exercising well. Doctors are going to tell you six, seven small meals a day. I don't care what a doctor says. I'm talking about your brain. What's your brain need? One warm meal a day and a few snacks. Exercise. I don't mean join Gold's Gym, but if you do, that's cool. I mean take the stairs or walk your dog or something. So real quick, we need to earn all of our resiliencies. So I want you to stand up real quick. I want you to put your hands on your hips. And I want you to stand in one of two ways. Either put your hands on your hips with your legs about shoulder width apart, have amazing posture. All right, hands on your hips just like this. Or you can go the other way and go straight up. Either way, but I'm going to ask that you hold it for about a minute. All right, so ready? Uh, a lot of you are going to want to change and do your normal posture. Don't. Hold this posture. Why are you holding this posture? Anyone know what this is called? It's called power stancing. Power stancing. Amy Cuddy has some really great research about this. Power stancing shows your brain, it proves to your brain that you're courageous. It actually increases your courage level. They've done lots of research at Harvard about it. So when you power stance for at least two minutes, your courage goes up by about 30%. They did a few things. They took people, they put them in a room, and they had them do power stances, things like this and like this, and the boss stance where your feet are on the desk. And they did all of those, and then they did scans and assessments and measured your courage, and it went up. They took this other group of unfortunate people and had them do unpowerful stances, things to make yourself small, like this and like this. And their courage went down. Because your brain and your body, they don't pull for your opinion. I know we think we're in control, but we're not. So when you do these things, they tell your brain you're real powerful. There's another power stance. You've seen it a lot. We call it the arrogant guy. You know what that looks like? Sorry if you're in here, guy. Um, but you know what that looks like? They take up all the space when they sit down, right? They're feeling real powerful, my friends, and that is good. So you know what I tell you to do? I tell you to lie to your brain. When you start to feel unpowerful, just trick yourself out a bit. I did this recently. I did a TED Talk last year. I never get afraid when I speak. I love to speak. Favorite thing in the world. For some reason, I was terrified suddenly, like two minutes before going on stage. Could not think anymore. So instead, what I did to help myself out is I took a shot of rum that they had back there to help because I couldn't hurt. And then I did some power stancing and I could tell the producer was back there thinking I was flipping out because suddenly I'm chilling like this and suddenly I'm just like. <laughs> because I had to tell my brain, you're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay because I was petrified. And I got on stage and the producer tried to give me a high five as I was walking up like, you're gonna rock it and I was like, Ooh. Like, I didn't give him a high five. My brain was not working, but I got on stage and I did it. So when you have to, just trick your brain out. It's okay. Give yourselves a round of applause for power stancing. Let's talk about a few more real quick, and then I'm going to let you go. We're going to try to keep with the schedule. Little things make a big difference. This is Gregory Miner. He decided to just start taking the stairs. That's it. Just the stairs. He lost a pound a week. 1.4 pounds a week to be exact. That's what it looks like a year and a half later when you make little changes. Prayer, meditation, and relationships, what does this look like? I want you to have real friends, not 582 Facebook friends. I mean real friends, the ones that get to come into your dirty, nasty house. All right, not the ones that when you invite them over, you speed home, do the 10 most effective cleanings you've done all week long, and then when you open the door and let them in, you lie to them and say, sorry, it's so messy. <laughs> not those friends. The friends that they walk into your chaos and you're like, it's just life, bro, come on in. Those real friends, that's what you need. The truth is, 
I had to do this purposely. You might be a lot better than me. You might just let people see the unedited versions of you, but I didn't for a long time. So I purposely invited a friend over and purposely didn't clean my house. And it was so hard. Do you know what made it harder? She called and said, I'm running 20 minutes late. Do you know what I can do with those 20 minutes? <laughs> clean my house! And I didn't. And did you know, she walked in and said, oh my goodness, it is so disgusting in here. No, she walked in and hung out with me because she doesn't care about my house. And I'm telling my brain it's okay to be real. So real quick, I want to actually build, I want to build these, re these resiliencies. So we started about 15 minutes late. I'm going to end in two minutes. I'm going to take two minutes because I want you to learn about these resiliencies. If you need to go, you can go, but I'm going to go over just a little bit. How do you build this resiliency? Prayer meditation, we understand that. Another way to build this resiliency, turn to someone real quick and shake their hand for six seconds. Oh All right, six seconds, we can do it, go. One. Very good, thank you, can you do me a favor? Can you shake his hand? All right, so normally in this part, I would have had you choose one of two things. I would have either had you text someone and tell them how important they are to you or had you shake someone's hand. I've often had overachievers doing both. All right, so why do we do this? Because it increases your oxytocin level. Oxytocin is the chemical that makes you feel bonded to other people. So it fills that relationship thing. At one of my conferences, I had a guy, I happened to be there the next day listening, and I had a guy who came up to me and said, Amy, I did all my resiliencies this morning before I left, just like you told us to yesterday. I said, that is awesome. He said, yeah, so this morning right before I left, I shook my wife's hand for six seconds. <laughs> I said, bro, you can hug her or kiss her. I mean, we're just a room full of strangers, so I had to shake hands, but there are other ways to increase that oxytocin, all right? So increasing the oxytocin, here's a, here's a quick little tip for you, by the way. If you're going in for a new job interview with the same company, but you're getting a promotion, um, power stance for two minutes where nobody can see you. And then don't shake their hand for six seconds. It's weird, but <laughs> you can vary it up. You can be like, hey, it's so good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Six seconds physical touch, not creepy and they're gonna feel bonded, you're gonna feel powerful, I guarantee you're getting the job. All right, emotions. You need to cry. You need to laugh. Did you know when you cry, your body releases all of those endorphins and they start to heal you, they have healing properties. Endorphins start to heal you. That's why after you cry, you feel euphoric, right? Did you know a good laugh can loosen your muscles for 45 minutes? Did you know a good laugh opens up your blood vessels and reduces your chance of a cardiovascular emergency? Prevents a heart attack by laughing. What else can you do? Go outside and get some sunshine. Celebrate your victories. You were taught not to toot your own horn. I say go ahead, toot your horn. And if you have nobody to toot your horn to, Go to CunninghamCompassion.com and email me, and you can tell me all your victories, and I will celebrate them with you. Because you need to be celebrating your victories, because the world really sucks sometimes. We already know that. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. The world really sucks this last week. All right? My neighbors are Corpus Christi, and Houston, and we run hospitals. It's a sucky week, all right? We already know that. The news tells us that. We have, at my house, we haven't even been watching the news this week because we don't need that trauma in our lives because we got enough friends texting us. We've got enough knowing what's going on. We don't need Good Morning America to tell us what's happening. 
It's important to celebrate victories because failures and negative things and trauma, they're all around you without your permission. Little ways you can celebrate victories or you can get resiliencies, get happy. Um, baby animals help. Also, just watching a funny video, which unfortunately we don't have time for, but you can Hello. Google it. It's called Pine Saw Prank. If you didn't get to laugh today, look that one up. All right, and real quick, psychological, how are you gonna boost this resiliency? You're gonna do things like um, tell your brain you're gonna do something and then actually do it. So it's as simple as I'm gonna dust my dresser when I get home, then I dust my dresser, then my brain says victory. All right, so let me tell you how we're gonna do it right now. You're gonna very silently, silently count backwards from 50 to zero, go. When you're done, give me a thumbs up. Why do I have you do that? Keep counting if you're not done. Because it's a little deviation from what is normal and your brain just registered it as a victory. What else could you do? Snap up to 50. Go make your bed, dust your dresser, do something. Tell your brain you're gonna do it, then go do it. it, it registers that victory. That's what you do every day, these things. Do the power stancing or um, some type of physical activity. Do the emotion or spiritual or meditation. Text somebody, love them, give them a hug, pray or meditate. Do the psychological and then for your work, real quick, let me tell what, you what I want you to do. I want you to take care of yourself and I want you to avoid self-entitlement, and I want you to do transitions. What does a transition look like? Transition means every day I tell my brain I'm not at work anymore. Because if I were to keep these lights on all the time, what would they do? They'd burn out. So a transition I do at home looks like this. Right when I walk in. Badge off. This means I'm home. Maybe you take a shower or have an adult beverage within modif mod modified adult beverage. Okay, like one or two. That's it, technically. All right, so you do something that tells your brain you're not at work anymore and you chill out. I am still at work, so this is weird. Um, all right. Because our goal is to make sure that you know you're a victor, not a victim and for you to have compassion satisfaction, which is where you love your job. And we want you to reach the highest level of resiliency, which is serendipity. It means that you have the ability to turn your lemons into lemonade, lemon meringue, margaritas, whatever you wanna do with your lemons, that you turn them around, all right? So, last thing I wanna do, your work-life balance wheel. What you're gonna do here later is you're gonna measure yourself how well you feel you are doing in these items. And then if you feel like you need to improve that area, choose two areas that are a little low, start to consciously work on them to improve them. Then in three months, come back and do the wheel again because the areas that used to be strong are gonna be a little weaker now and you're gonna to have to rotate. It's like rotating your tires. You're just gonna keep doing it. This is how we balance our life. All right, because we can't be all things to all people and be perfect. We can't. And if you keep trying, you're gonna burn out. All right, makes sense? Last thing I wanna do is tell you there's an app for that. For what? For any of these resiliencies I just mentioned. Psychological, mental, spiritual, relationships, whatever it is, there is an app that can help you get it done. All right, so use your smart technology to make you better. Last thing I wanna do, and we're closing with this. First of all, what questions or comments do you have? We're running a little late, so I'm just gonna chill here during lunch. You wanna talk to me, you can. This is the last thing I'm gonna do. I wanna give you a prize. Is that okay? I love to read. I usually read at minimum two books a month, which some of you read a lot more within that, and that's cool. I have five kids, so two, months, two books a month on audible.com. All right, that's how I do it. You smart people read real books, I do Audible. 
All right? So I love books, though. I love them. In sessions like this, I'll usually like list 12 books randomly, and people say, what books did you list? I'm like, I don't know. I just love books. So if it came to my head, I said it. So I want to give you a book real quick. So, um, but I'm only going to give you one because I have three sessions today, and I have three books. So stand on up.